You don't know anything about the Velociraptor. You see, thanks to movies like Jurassic Park, the dinosaur we all know and love is, well, let's just say it's Hollywood's version. But don't worry, I'm here to set the record straight. So sit back, relax, grab your dino nuggets, and get ready to meet the real Velociraptor. First, I think it's important we discuss how the Velociraptor was found in the first place. Our story begins with this guy, Henry Fairfield Osborne, an American paleontologist, geologist, and racist supporter of eugenics. Anyway, old Henry here believed in a little theory, the out of Asia theory, unlike the out of Africa theory, which states that human ancestors evolved in Africa before spreading across the globe. Henry was convinced that Asia was the true birthplace of humanity, and he really wanted to prove it. But he had one problem. How do you do that? Well, simple. Fund massive expeditions to Asia and go fossil hunting. Of course, this wasn't a one-man job, but where would he find a team? Oh, that's right. Henry was the literal president of the American Museum of Natural History. So, uh, that worked out. So he assembled a crew of up to 40 scientists, assistants, and drivers, then cast Roy Chapman Andrews as expedition leader, with Walter Willis Granger as second in command. Thus began the journey to the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. Over multiple expeditions, known as the First, Second, and Third Asiatic Expeditions, later changed to simply the Central Asiatic Expeditions, they uncovered a gold mine of prehistoric fossils. But it was in the Jadokta Formation, specifically in the Flaming Cliffs, so named because, well, just look at that color that dinosaur hunter Peter Kazin made history. On August 11th, 1923, he uncovered a crushed skull and distinct claw bone, the first ever Velociraptor fossils discovered. Peter collected the fossils and brought them back to Henry, who then named the creature, drumroll please, Ovalraptor Jadoctory. Eventually though, he changed the name to Velociraptor Mongoliensis, meaning swift thief of Mongolia in Latin. Now fast forward a few decades, enter the Cold War. American paleontologists weren't allowed to dig in communist Mongolia, but Polish and Soviet teams, with the help of Mongolian colleagues, discovered even more Velociraptor fossils, including one of the most famous and incredible fossils ever found, but we'll get into that later. Later on, the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences, a very humble name, partnered with the Inner Mongolia Museum to launch the Sino-Belgian Dinosaur Expeditions. During these digs, they uncovered a partial skull in the Bai and Mandahu Formation of China. Thanks to my good man and Belgian paleontologist Pascal Goldefreit and his colleagues, it was named Velociraptor Osmolske in honor of Polish paleontologist Halska Osmolska. Oh, and by the way, old Henry never did find any evidence for his out of Asia theory. The Jurassic Park movies depict Velociraptor as being large, scaly, and, well, like this. But what did it actually look like, and how did we even get to that point? Well, once again, it all starts with our guy Henry. In 1924, one year after its discovery, Henry created the first ever reconstruction of Velociraptor, based only on the skull and single toe claw. Now I know he didn't have much to work with, but just oh look at the poor thing. But at the time, this was the best depiction we had. However, as more fossils were uncovered, we got a much clearer picture of what Velociraptor actually looked like. Then came the 1960s, and the discovery of Archaeopteryx, the first dinosaur ever confirmed to have feathers. This would go on to help paleontologists understand that dinosaurs weren't all scaly. The thing is, we just didn't know which ones had feathers. Fast forward to 1993, Jurassic Park debuts with its now iconic Velociraptor design. Now, you might be able to excuse the lack of feathers on the design, since back then the consensus was that most most dinosaurs, including Velociraptor, didn't have feathers. But how in the world did it suddenly become six feet? Well, it turns out the Velociraptors in Jurassic Park were actually based on Deinonychus, another dromaeosaur, so why not just call them Deinonychus? Well, it's actually only one reason. Drama. Basically, Michael Crichton, the author of the Jurassic Park novel, thought Velociraptor sounded more dramatic. Anyways, cut to the 2000s and the discovery of Microraptor, providing direct evidence that dromaeosaurs, like Velociraptor, were at least partially feathered. Then, in 2007, paleontologists analyzing a Velociraptor forearm fossil, found in 1998, discovered something interesting. Quill knobs. These knobs were tiny bumps on the bone, where feathers would attach, proving Velociraptor had long feathers running down its arm, all the way to its second finger. Now jump to the present. 
We now know Velociraptor was around 1.6 feet tall at the hip, about the size of a turkey, and was up to 6.8 feet long, with most of that length being in its tail. Like other dromaeosaurs, Velociraptor's tail was reinforced with rod-like extensions called, uh, that which made it incredibly stiff and perfect for balancing at high speeds, similar to how a cheetah uses its tail. However, one feature unique to Velociraptor is its distinctly upcurved snout. The snout was incredibly long, making up about 60% of the skull, but focusing more on the mouth, Velociraptor's teeth were all pretty much the same size and shape, known as homodon dentition, but there were serrations on the backs of the teeth, similar to a steak knife. The hands of Velociraptor, like other dromaeosaurs, were relatively large, and had three long fingers, though they'd help very little in opening doors. This is because if it tried, it would literally break its hand. This is because the anatomy of the wrist would prevent it from moving in a way needed to open a door. And of course, we can't forget about this. Velociraptor actually had four toes, but it looked more like three. The first, a uh, tiny dew claw, didn't even touch the ground, but on the second toe was the iconic sickle claw. The three inch long weapon we see today is actually only the core of the claw. Like birds today, the claw would have been covered in a protective sheath of keratin, meaning the actual claw was even bigger. Velociraptor would have held its claw off the ground to prevent the tip from becoming dull. Because of this, Velociraptor only walked on its third and fourth toes. But even on two toes, the creature was still pretty fast. In fact, it could reach speeds of up to 25 miles an hour, as the legs had large muscles connected to a long shin bone. So if you decided to race one, you'd absolutely get steamrolled. In Jurassic Park, the Velociraptors are depicted as relentless killing machines. But how did the dinosaur actually live and behave? Well, first off, Velociraptor wasn't some ruthless, bloodthirsty monster. It was an animal, just like the ones alive today. But when it did go hunting, I'd imagine it wasn't pretty. So how did the Velociraptor get the job done? For starters, it had an array of powerful senses, including an excellent sense of smell, large eyes to help it see at night, and excellent high-frequency hearing, thought to be able to track sounds around 2300 and 2900 hertz. These adaptations made Velociraptor an excellent ambush predator, allowing it to stalk prey before striking. But what did it hunt? Its diet mostly consisted of lizards, early mammals, or small, even baby dinosaurs. Unlike what the Jurassic Park movies depict, Velociraptor probably wasn't a pack hunter. Instead, it would hunt alone. So, when a Velociraptor would spot its prey, it would pounce, using its sickle claw to pin it down, similar to how hawks hunt today. The claw would slice deep into the prey, piercing through vital organs and causing severe bleeding. But it wouldn't stop there. The Velociraptor would bite down with a force of around 70 pounds, the teeth shredding through the flesh. All this while the toe claw is still in the poor thing, preventing it from escaping. If all went well, the prey would die, the Velociraptor would eat, and go on to live another day. But if things didn't go so well, well, the raptor would just have to go hungry. That is, unless it got desperate. Much like this specimen with a pterosaur bone found in its stomach. The animal, hungry, probably stumbled across a pterosaur carcass. However, the thing basically had no meat on it. But nonetheless, the raptor decided to eat a bone, and promptly scarfed it down. Not too long after this, the thing up and died, possibly the result of an injury sustained before, and became a fossil we later discovered, giving us a chance to realize that Velociraptor wasn't too different from that of a dog. Which brings us to another debate. Just how smart was Velociraptor? The Jurassic Park movies make Velociraptor out to be borderline genius. But in reality, based on the evidence we have, Velociraptor probably had an IQ similar to that of a chicken. Another Jurassic Park staple is the raptors tapping their sickle claws. But is there any evidence to this behavior? Well, uh, no. Mystery solved. In the movies, the toe tapping was meant to make the raptors seem more attentive and focused, with some theories even suggesting that it was a form of echolocation. But anyways, let's go back to that incredible discovery made earlier, and focus on a particularly important hunt. A Velociraptor stalks a Protoceratops. It lurks in the shadows, waiting for the perfect moment. Then, without a warning, it lunges. 
The raptor pounces, slashing and biting, but things go horribly wrong. The protoceratops isn't going down without a fight. Before long, the raptor finds itself on its back. The protoceratops clamps down on the raptor's arm, pinning it to the ground with its weight. In desperation, the raptor slashes at the attacker's face with its free hand and plunges its sickle claw into the dinosaur's neck. Both dinosaurs, badly wounded, snarl in pain as blood soaks the sand beneath them. But they continue to struggle, each refusing to back down. Then, suddenly, everything goes black. It's 1971. A Polish-Mongolian team of paleontologists explore the white sandstone cliffs of Mongolia. Then, they find it. What they discovered was a prehistoric battle trapped in time, nicknamed the Fighting Dinosaurs. Turns out that as the two dinosaurs were fighting, a massive sand dune collapsed, burying them alive. Though, this is just one theory proposed by earlier discussed Hauska Osmolska. Other theories suggest the two fell into a swamp-like body of water as they thrashed around, continuing the fight underwater until they both drowned. Others argue that the Velociraptor was just scavenging an already dead Protoceratops, when, in an unknown event, it got buried. But I find that hard to swallow, because if that's the case, what in the world was Buddy doing posing like this? Like, like actually. I mean, at that point, it, it kind of deserved to die. Scientists also found this theory to be unlikely, noting that the position of both dinosaurs suggests they died at the same time. One other theory proposed reads more like a Greek tragedy than anything. It goes that the Protoceratops, mortally wounded, knew it was going to die, the result of a previous scuffle with the Velociraptor. So in a sort of, if I'm going down, you're coming with me kind of move, it clamped down on the Velociraptor's arm, breaking it, then crushing the dinosaur under its own weight. This would end up killing the Velociraptor. But just a few moments later, the Protoceratops would succumb to its injuries. Then, over time, the two were buried in sand. But before this could happen, it's believed scavengers found the body and started feasting on the Protoceratops. And this could explain certain oddities in the fossil, like, and you probably won't understand most of these words, but here it goes, the coracoids having bone fragments and hints towards a broken pectoral girdle, and the rightmost forelimb of the scapulocoracoid being displaced to the left and backwards relative to the torso. But others think the damage is a product of the battle itself. Or, even more tragic, the culprit might just be other protoceratops trying to pull their dying friend out of the sand, as it's thought the dinosaurs lived in herds. Whatever happened, it gave us a cool fossil, to say the least. Too cool for people not to capitalize on it. That's why, in the year 2000, the American Museum of Natural History, now under the rule of Ellen V. Footer, instead of Old Henry, launched a traveling exhibit called The Fighting Dinosaurs, New Discoveries from Mongolia. Mongolia. The exhibit showcased this fossil, alongside more than 30 other incredible discoveries from the Gobi Desert, bringing this ancient battle to North America for the first time. Today, the fossil stands as a national treasure of Mongolia, and for good reason. It helped shatter the outdated idea that dinosaurs were slow, sluggish creatures, and gave us a real glimpse into their lives. It allowed us to imagine how they lived and behaved, to see them not as monsters or villains in a movie, but as real animals. It gave us a chance to meet the real Velociraptor.